Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we're continuing with my Bite Size Archaeology series where I run you through some of the basics of archaeology. Last time we talked about what an artifact was and I told you there are quite a few things on an archaeological site that are archaeologically important but actually aren't artifacts. So what are they? Well, some of them are ecofacts. Ecofacts, which are also sometimes called biofacts, are any portable, natural thing that has been unintentionally created, used, or altered by humans. So we're looking for natural things that humans didn't mean to interact with, but they did anyway. Let's do the same thing we did last time. I've got a bunch of stuff here, including things in my inventory, some of which are ecofacts and some of which aren't. As I walk around, take a guess as to what the ecofacts are. Now, a lot of ecofacts aren't something I can represent in Minecraft, so also think about how something you might see here could have ecofacts around it and what those might be, even if you can't see them in Minecraft. Also, I know a lot of this stuff is the same as last time, but I have changed things out or added things to this, so be sure to take a look even if you saw my last episode. Okay, so now that we've taken a look around and you've got thoughts about what might be an ecofact, let's talk about that definition one more time. An ecofact is any portable natural thing that was unintentionally created, used, or altered by humans. The first part of our definition that's important is portability. We saw this with artifacts, but it's also true of ecofacts. This one's pretty simple. If you can pick up an object or an item and move it, then it could be an ecofact. If you can't move it, like a tree or a bush that's rooted to the ground or the house over there, then it's generally not an ecofact. The second big part of our ecofact definition is the eco part. An ecofact is any portable, natural thing, meaning it came from nature. A piece of glassy slag that formed as a byproduct of metalworking isn't really an ecofact because it originated in a man-made process. So we're looking for things like plants, animals, organic remains, soil, stones, food waste, ash, that sort of thing. Now, a lot of things people use or create originate in nature, so this can be a bit difficult to narrow down between artifacts or ecofacts or something else entirely. I tend to think of this criteria less as something needing to be inherently natural versus man-made because there's a lot of gray area in there, and more that this criteria is emphasizing the connection the item or object or sample has to nature. Also, just to make an important point here, most definitions you see for ecofacts or biofacts might say that they're only organic materials, but actually, so long as it originated in nature, ecofacts or biofacts can include organic materials like plants and animal bones, and inorganic materials like minerals or even the natural glass that forms when lightning strikes sand. The next big element of our definition is intention, and this is the biggest point where an ecofact differs from an artifact. Ecofacts were made, used, and created unintentionally, while artifacts were made, used, and created intentionally. Remember these flowers from our last episode? I didn't plant them, but since they're next to my house here, I will unintentionally use and alter these flowers simply by existing in the same space as them. So these flowers are ecofacts. Going back to the glass example from before, glassy slag unintentionally made as a byproduct in metalworking isn't an ecofact because it originated in a man-made process, and a blob of glass that forms when lightning strikes sand during a thunderstorm isn't an ecofact unless someone unintentionally alters or uses it somehow. But if someone is testing the effectiveness of a lightning rod on some sand for some reason, the blob of glass that forms underneath it would be an ecofact because it is something that originates through natural processes and is unintentionally created by the person putting the lightning rod where they did. Another good example here is pollen. The pollen that you breathe in ends up in your airways and your digestive system. I'm pretty sure no one intentionally breathes in pollen. In fact, I bet if most people could opt to not breathe in pollen, they probably would. But in breathing in that pollen, you are unintentionally consuming it and therefore altering it. So all that pollen clogging up your sinuses? Ecofacts. And the final part of our definition is the same as artifacts once again created, altered, or used by humans. Basically, that means that if people interacted with it, it could be an ecofact. So anything humans don't interact with isn't an ecofact. But this isn't super clear cut as it is with artifacts because of the unintentional part. And this leads us into a really important point. 
Humans create ecofacts simply by existing in a space because that existence in that space changes the ecology of that spot into something that it wasn't before. Where I live in Scotland, for example, any evidence of foxes found anywhere near human settlements is going to be significantly different to evidence of foxes found further out in the wild because existing in a city or town gives those urban foxes access to food sources that they wouldn't have elsewhere. Plants, animals, insects, bacteria, fungi, and anything they affect that exist in a space with humans are all ecofacts because our settling in that spot changed their ecosystem and therefore unintentionally encouraged certain natural organisms and processes and discouraged others. One of the biggest examples of this is insects. There are many types of insects that often gravitate towards human settlements, like certain types of cockroaches, lice, and fleas. The hairy cellar beetle, Mycetae subterranean, has a strong association with decay straw and wood in dry cellars, barns, or stables. So there might be some of those in this thatch floor here. Other insects gravitate towards cesspits like certain types of spider beetle, and others like to bore into wooden furniture or beams like the common furniture beetle. While these insects definitely exist outside of human settlements, any that exist within or around them are an indication of the changes those humans made to that ecosystem. So their remains and any evidence for their existence in that human settlement are ecofacts. If we look at Minecraft, some good examples of unintentional natural things created by player actions are the rooted dirt made when growing azalea trees or the podzel that gets created when growing large spruce trees. Often the soil types are more of an unintentional byproduct from growing the trees. Now, there are certainly players who will be just as intentional about making the podzel or rooted dirt as they are about the trees, and I am certainly one of them. But anytime you've made a large spruce tree in Minecraft and didn't care so much about the podzel, you made Minecraft Ecofact. Now, as I've said already, it's not always clear whether something is intentionally or unintentionally created, altered, or used. And you may have noticed that it might be a bit difficult to figure out intention just from the objects or items left behind. In the Podzil example that I just gave, how do we know that the person who grew the tree didn't intend for the Podzil to form underneath it? Maybe they did. Or with our campfire over here, how do we know that it wasn't set with at least some intention of collecting the ash or charcoal afterwards? Sometimes we can take a pretty educated guess, Unless you grew up in a house with an entomologist like I did, chances are your family didn't intentionally interact with the silverfish in your attic. But sometimes it's harder to predict whether something was intentional. I know that these flowers over here are ecofacts because I didn't plant them, for example, and none of the villagers did either. But would an archaeologist in 200 years be able to know that based purely off of the flower's remains? Maybe, but maybe not. And because of that, you might see some finds in archaeology classed as both artifacts and ecofacts for example. Or you might see something classed as an ecofact for many years only to switch to an artifact after further investigation reveals that there was more intention there. So taking a look around, what are the ecofacts here? Or at least what might we consider to be ecofacts? Definitely the dandelions, both over here and over there. Also the podzel and the rooted dirt, like we've already said. Over on the well and the pillar here, we have moss growing on the stone, which wouldn't be growing there if we hadn't put the stones there. So that is an ecofact. The same is true for the vines on the sides of the house, although that's one that can go either way. Lots of people plant ivy around their houses, for example. Inside the house, any plant, insect, or other biological material in the thatch floor is an ecofact, and so are the cobwebs up in the rafters. Any ash left in the furnace or dead bugs on the windowsills are also ecofacts, and there are probably bugs somewhere in the roof too. Outside the house over here, most things are artifacts like we said last time, but if any bugs or worms started eating this cake, or if we found any insects or plant matter stuck to the banner or around the flowers or cobwebs, those would all be ecofacts. The same is true over at our garden here. Any insects on our plants or in our composter, any microorganisms or pollen or worms or any evidence of small rodents or deer or other animals that like to eat vegetable gardens are all ecofacts. Over here by the campfire, any charcoal that gets left behind is an ecofact too. And lastly, any biological remains or evidence of biological activity like pollen, food waste, scat, burrows, and the like are usually all ecofacts if they occur in or around spaces with human activity. So how do you think you did? Did you think of anything I did? Let me know down in the comments.
And that's it. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and consider subscribing to the channel. Also, if you have an archaeological question you'd like me to answer, leave it in a comment down below. And for anybody who's interested, I recently launched a Patreon. Patrons get access to the schematics for my Minecraft builds, along with things like digital site reports with more information about the site, patron-only live streams, and monthly Q&As. If that sounds like something you're interested in, or you'd just like to support the channel, check out the link in the description box below. Speaking of which, special thanks to all of my current patrons. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to make these videos, so thank you very much for supporting the channel. That's all from me for today. Thank you all for tuning in, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye!